Hey, good morning and welcome to Real Life Church. I'm Pastor Bob and I'll be leading us this morning as we continue in our study of the book of 1 Peter. Now we're gonna be jumping right into chapter two this morning and looking at the first 12 verses, asking ourselves those same three questions. Matter of fact, I, I, I wonder what you know if you, if you know what those questions are already. You do, don't you? What does the passage say? What does it mean? And how can I put it into practice in my everyday real life? Now remember, Peter's writing this book to Christians, okay? They are scattered throughout all of what we would call modern day Turkey. There's severe persecution. And if you remember in chapter one, he told them, man, you got something that's great. You've got salvation. And I remember talking with Pastor Augie about being glad that I have salvation, all right? Um, and, And that's what he's reminding us today. You have salvation. And therefore, because you have salvation, uh, remember from last week, be holy as God is holy. All right? Um, And and now in verse, you know, the verses we're looking at this morning, um, in in verse 1 and 2, it's going to kick off with the same word that we had last week, the word therefore. Now, I remember one of my Bible teachers telling me that when you have a therefore, you got to know what the there is there for. And, and so when we look at chapter two, we're basing this whole passage on chapter one. You have salvation. Now be holy as God is holy. And that leads us right into our text this morning. And so um, here, let's just read um, verses two and three and, then, and talk about some of these specific things that Peter's mentioning here. It says, therefore, rid yourselves of all malice, and all deceit, hypocrisy, and envy, and all slander. And like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. Now, we're supposed to purge sin from our life. And it's interesting, okay, that Peter starts to list a few of those sins, okay? Um, First of all, he says that we're supposed to purge all types of malice, all deceit, all hypocrisy, envy, and slander. Now, malice is a sin, okay? It's kind of a nasty one, all right? It's, It's the desire to want to harm someone else. Um, it's kind of a general word that means wickedness, okay? It it's, gives us a picture of wanting to stab someone in the back. And, and basically what Peter is saying is because you're a Christian, therefore, because you're a Christian, because you have salvation, because you're supposed to be holy, purge yourself of all malice. And then he goes on in our list of sins, and he says you're supposed to purge yourself of all deceit. It means being dishonest, falsehood, treachery. We're supposed to be people of truth, right? We're not supposed to trap people with deceit and hope they fall into some type of, you know, of one of our devious plans that we come up with. That's trickery. And and, and we're not supposed to represent any of that. And Peter says, because you're a Christian, because you have salvation, because you're supposed to be holy, you got to put away all types of deceit. Then he says hypocrisy and you know, he's starting to get personal here for a minute. He says, it means you got to take off the masks, okay? You got to be consistent with who you are, okay, in Christ Jesus. You got to be the same way on Monday as you are on Thursday, as you are on Sunday morning when you're gathering around with your family to listen or be here at church. You know, we're not supposed to be two different ways with, depending on who we're with. We're supposed to be consistent. We're supposed to reflect Christ. And then Peter talks about, you know, this attitude of resenting someone else, okay, that leads, um, if you want to call it, to grudges and bitterness and hatred and conflict. Um, you know, all that kind of stuff, we're supposed to put it away. And, and when we do do that kind of stuff, it's like a slap in the face to God, okay, because we're not supposed to be that way. We're supposed to purge ourselves, okay, of all sin. And then he goes on, the last one, he says that we're supposed to put away all slander. We're supposed to put away those whispers, okay, the, the 
talking behind someone's back, the, the backbiting and the nipping that we like to do to try to make maybe ourselves look better and them worse. We're not supposed to enjoy running people down because it's the opposite of what we're supposed to be doing in Christ Jesus. Now, Peter could have gone on with all kinds of different sin, and, and, and that's why I said we're supposed to purge ourselves of sin because we have salvation, and again, because we're supposed to be holy. That's what that there is there for. Then he goes on to say we're not only supposed to purge ourselves from sin, but we're supposed to, like a newborn baby, okay, we're supposed to long for the pure milk of God's word. You know, if you wanna purge yourself from sin, you're gonna have to get into God's word, okay? That's the instruction for our life. And not only that, we're supposed to long for it like a newborn babe. Now, it's been a long time. My kids are way past the newborn babe stage, okay? But we do have a couple families in our church that have some brand new newborns. And I know one thing about babies that I remember, when they're hungry, they let you know. And they have a way of letting you know until you feed them, okay? How are you longing for God's word this morning? I mean, is that, is that kind of like a, a foreign statement to us? Do we really, I mean, honestly, now being transparent with, do we really long for God's word? I mean, because a baby, it, it doesn't stop, okay? Until you feed it, it cries and it cries and it gets worse and it gets worse. And let me tell you something. Do we have that same yearning, that same desire to push, okay, for God's word? I mean, if we're going to push for God's word, that's going to require some work on our part, okay? It means that we're going to have to get into God's word. We're supposed to long for it. So uh, this is a hard question. I get it. We're, we're being a little personal this morning. Do you, do you long for God's word? I mean, do you have an intense desire, a hungering, a, a, a hankering, okay, for God's word? Do you, do you really have that here um, this morning? Is that how you would describe yourself? Man, I hope so. And if not, maybe you need to pray. Maybe you need to stop right now before you do anything else, before you listen any farther and ask God and ask God to forgive you for not having that, you know, that yearning for God's word. Now, when we yearn for something, that means we have a tenacity about us, just like that newborn babe. It won't stop until it gets what it needs. That's my prayer for anyone listening today, that you will have a tenacity and you'll devour again God's word because that's what's gonna help us what? To be holy, okay? And that's what Peter's talking about and that's what we've been talking about the last three weeks. Now, let's talk. Let, let, let's, let's go on here. Not only are we supposed to long for the, 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 the milk of God's word, we're supposed, to, we're supposed to grow up, okay? And we're supposed to pursue some type of spiritual growth in our life. Do you wanna grow this morning? I mean, do you really wanna grow this morning? Now, the easy answer is, of course, you know, Pastor, I'm listening to you. I, well, that's a good start, okay? That's, that, that's, yeah, I'm not even sure it's a good start, but it's a start, okay? But, I mean, are you really pursuing spiritual growth? I mean, if you get to live another 90 days, okay, will you be farther in your spiritual walk in 90 days than you are right now? How will that happen? I mean, are you just hoping that 90 days from now you'll be more spiritual, okay? Whatever that looks like. I'm gonna tell you something. If, if you're not pursuing it and you don't have a plan for it and you're, and you're not doing something for it, it's not gonna happen. I want you to pursue spiritual growth. The, the type of spiritual growth we're talking about here um, in 1 Peter chapter two. Now, why? Okay, because this is so important. 
we're supposed to, again, we're supposed to stop sinning, purge our sin. We're supposed to pursue, uh, you know, uh, and push for our, our need in God's word. And we're supposed to have this spiritual growth. The answer is right there in the back part of that verse when it talks about because you have tasted of the kindness of the Lord. Think about that. Because you know how good God is. And it, watch this. The, the more you understand how good God is, the more you really want to get to know him. And the more that you really want to get to know him, well, the way to get to know him is to huh, get into his word. That's where he reveals himself. And by the way, when you get into his word, his word helps convict us of those things, those areas in our life that God wants to work on. See how it all kind of works together? Because you have this great thing called salvation, be holy, okay? Um, pursue um, spiritual growth. See it all because you've tasted of the kindness of the Lord. And, and see, here's the tricky part about this because a lot of times, I wanna be careful about this because a lot of times when I'm teaching, uh, it, it's like you have to do something. And yes and no, because see, when we have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes inside of us and begins to new, do a new work within us. So the doing aspect is a natural byproduct of the Holy Spirit of God living within us. Now, honestly, I, I, I've said this before and it sounds harsh. If you don't have a desire to grow and you don't have a desire to be holy and you really don't have a desire to pursue God, well, <laughs> you may not have the Spirit of God living within you because that's what the Spirit of God does. It wants you to know your Savior. And how do you get to know your Savior? Well, by the things that we've talked about. Now, let's go on, okay? Because we got a few more verses that I want to cover this morning. And it says, and coming to him. Now, we're not talking about salvation here. We're talking about that my job as a Christian is to always come to him, okay? Um, and so let's go on. And coming to him as a living stone. Now, you know, in the Bible, lots of times, you know, um, Jesus is referred to as one thing, and, and so are you, by the way. And there's lots of times that Jesus was referred to as a high priest, and, and, and but believe it or not, you're referred to as a priest. In God's word, um, Jesus is referred to as a lamb. And if you look in God's word, you've been referred to as a lamb. And, and now, in this passage, Peter is going to refer to not only Jesus as a living stone, but you and I as a living stone. And then he's going to refer to Jesus as the chief cornerstone. So read with me again as we go. Coming to him as a living stone, which has been rejected by people, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. Think about that. Jesus was referred to as a living stone and he was rejected by people, right? But you're also referred to as a living stone. And if you're a living stone, there's a good chance that you too, I know this doesn't sound great, but you might be rejected by people, okay? Um, that, that's so important in this passage for us to understand this. It says you also, as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for what? Here's that word again, a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So if you're filling out that sermon outline, now these, um, these words start with the letter R, okay? Okay, um, you might be, okay, if you're a living stone this morning, you might be rejected by people. That's kind of hard to hear, isn't it? That if I continually come to the Father, like it says in verse four, um, if I continually try to be holy as he is holy, there might be some people that don't like what you stand for. And, and, and in small ways, we're starting to see that happen even more and more in the culture in which we live in today. It was true of Jesus, they rejected him, and it could be true of you also. Now, Peter was telling um, those that were scattered, um, expect people to reject you. 
okay? Because you are a what? A stranger living in a strange place. You represent something that's foreign to them. Peter is referring to us as a living stone. And when he does, he says this, and this gives me great encouragement, that I am precious in the sight of God. Man, I might be rejected by people, but I'm precious in the sight of God. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if you tweet anymore or if anybody has Twitter anymore, but that's, that's worthy of a tweet. I might be rejected by people, but I'm precious in the sight of God. Now, that might be more than 140 characters. I'm not sure. But um, anyway, those of you that tweet will be able to figure that out. Now, we don't live under the sacrificial system, right? Because we're supposed to be um, a sacrifice that's pleasing to God. And, and, you know, we don't, you know, we're not going to go out this afternoon and go get our cow or or our turtle does. But you realize that we are a living stone and we're supposed to be a living sacrifice, In other words, the way I live my life, I'm supposed to lay my all in all on the altar and say, here I am, God. Do whatever it is you want to do with my life. Wow, that's another kind of a deep concept that Peter's talking about here. Um, We're living stones that are built upon one another. and, and, And isn't that interesting that the church is built upon stone after stone after stone that have been fitted together by God? I mean, and, and some of our stones look different, but they are fitted together by God so that we could be a living sacrifice. Hmm. And then it goes on here in this passage, and then he's going to call um, Jesus uh, the chief cornerstone. We're going to see that here when I read here in just a second. The chief cornerstone. In other words, this was the most important stone in all of the building. This is where all the rest of the stones were aligned to. I know a lot of us would like to be that chief cornerstone and say that, you know what, everybody matched their life up to me. And um, look, Jesus is the chief cornerstone. Okay, we match our lives up to him and we're measured according to him. And aren't you glad, by the way, that your stone um, was built by our heavenly father? You, You don't make your own stone. You are shaped and you are equipped and you are fit into the, into the building um, however God wants you to be fit. You don't get to determine that on your own. God does that um, for you. One stone doesn't make a temple. Um, and it's amazing that the stones come from all different walks of life, all different people, and they're fitted together to reflect God. To be, again, his testimony. I love this passage. There's so much that we could talk about in our time together. Now, this is where it goes on because we get into a little bit of the Old Testament here in verses 6, 7, um, and 8, okay? Let's read these, and then we're going to kind of go right through them because I already kind of made most of these comments. It said, but it's contained in Scripture. Behold, I am laying in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone. That's Jesus, okay? Okay. And the one who believes in him will not be put to shame. Wow. The one who believes in him will not be put to shame. In verse 7, this precious value then is for you who believe, but for unbelievers, a stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word. And to this day, they were appointed. See, there are so many things that we could say, but God knew when he made Jesus a chief cornerstone that people were going to reject him. Well, they were still rejecting him today. All right? Now, verse 9 and following are some pretty cool verses. And like Pastor Augie said about three weeks ago, he said that we could make you know, nine or 10 messages out of one verse, okay? And and this is true of this one. Um, after he says that we're living stones and after he says that Jesus is the chief cornerstone, then he goes on to say this about you and I even today. And I know a lot of people say this is only about the people of Israel, but I want to encourage you, this was left here for us to be able to see in this time. But you are a chosen people You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 
a people for God's own possession. And this is why, that you may proclaim the excellence of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you were once not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. What does that make you feel like when God's word says right there in verse nine that he says, I chose you? I gotta tell you, I mean, I get them. I mean, I got them right now. The, the, the goosebumps come up, okay? When I think that God Almighty, I mean, I'm, we're talking God here, okay? All powerful, almighty, all holy. I mean, I mean, God who's done all the things, every wild story that you read in the Bible, that God chose you to be on his team, to represent him. You were chosen by God. <laughs> That's amazing. And you know what? I don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. But yet God still chose you. I mean, wow. I, I, there are very few words that I can say, but wow. God chose me. And, and I'm, supposed to, I'm supposed to live for him. That's why I'm supposed to purge my sin and I'm supposed to push towards my greatest need and I'm supposed to pursue, okay, spiritual growth because God chose me. And then look what he says here in verses 11 uh, and 12. And, and we're going to finish up with this. He says, beloved, and man, God's calling, he chose me and now he's calling me beloved. This is, this is, <laughs> this is awesome. I urge you, and this is what Peter's saying, I urge you as foreigners and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against your soul. Keep your behavior excellent amongst the Gentiles so that the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God on the day of visitation. Now, Peter's asking all of these believers that are scattered everywhere. And he's asking us today, okay? And he's giving us some pretty practical, good advice here. He's saying, brothers and sisters, uh, young people and old people, um, he's, he's saying, hey, you disciples of Jesus, you pastors, you elders, you children's workers, you youth workers, you worship team people, all you people that are listening online right now, you're strangers in a foreign world. Be careful about how you live because other people are watching. That's what he just said. Be careful about how you live because other people are watching and you have tremendous influence over people. You realize that, right? I know, I know that you, you think people ought to mind their own business and you think that people probably should not. But look, people are watching the way you live. And, and Peter's reminded us, abstain, okay? Purge yourself from that sin. Abstain those, uh, from those, those fleshly lusts and live for God. <laughs> That's what he says. We're supposed to be believers that are centered on the chief cornerstone. And our behavior, the way we act, is supposed to be excellent so that others might see God in you. It's hard for those that were living in the time of Peter, and it's hard for us today. Matter of fact, last week, I was reminded of this. I, I was actually reminded of this by someone else. They said, you know, I said those are simple words. Be holy, right? I mean, they're simple, right? Four-letter word, be holy. No, they, they, may, they might be simple words. But man, they're so hard. They are hard. But you can do it. You can change your behavior, my behavior, your behavior, to reflect God. In a hostile environment, in the workplace, at the home, we can live for God. 
and we can allow others to see God in and through us. Now, if you've tasted of God's kindness, you'll want to do these things because it pleases God. We can change our behavior, even though sometimes it's hard because we're supposed to be strangers living in a strange place. Peter reminds us that people are watching. Don't can be conformed. Don't act like other people so that people might see you and recognize God through you. Now, let me break this down one more time. God needs to help us change our mind so that we can change our behavior and that I might be able to help someone in this world be led to a God who can change and radically transform their life. Now, next week, we're going to be looking at verses 13 through 17. Man, I'm going to tell you now, okay? Some of you are going to be downright upset with me next week, all right? Some of you, man, you're going to get into the recording and I'm going to say something and you're going to just turn it off. And I'm going to tell you right now, go and look at those verses, 13 through 17. Ask yourself, what does this passage say? What does it mean? And how can I put it into practice in my daily life? And, and make me a promise that if I make you mad, you'll email me. You'll let me know, okay? Because you know what? We might have to agree to disagree, all right? But I think you're going to love, uh, well, maybe not love, but you're really going to well, I think we're in for a good time next week, no matter what verses 13 through 17 says. Now, remember this. Real life church exists to lead our community to life transformation that can only be found in Jesus. We do that because we have salvation, because we want to live a holy life so that others can be brought to someone who can radically change their life. God, here we are, a bunch of stones that have been fit together. Father, for your glory, for your honor to be your temple. God, I pray, oh Lord, that we would align ourselves to the chief cornerstone. We could have talked about that a lot, Lord, but I think people understand what that means, that the whole foundation is, is, is built on this chief cornerstone. Father, we're nothing without you. And so, God, I pray that everything that we do would be all about you. God, I pray that as we kind of looked at these verses, um, that you'll just help us to understand that there's so much writing on the way that we live our life. Because the Gentiles are watching. They're watching. And Father, we reflect Christ. And I pray my behavior and our behavior, Lord, would again be found worthy of our calling, which is in Christ Jesus. God, until we can meet again, verses 13 through 17, I pray your guidance over it. And Father, I pray that you're going to lead us next week. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. 13 through 17. You don't want to miss it. I'll see you next week.